A reading from Isaiah, the 35th chapter, beginning at the first, fourth verse. Say to those who are of fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. He will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. Then the lame shall leap like a deer, the tongue of the speeches sing for joy. For water shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirst, thirsty ground springs of water. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God all I have in me. Put not your trust in rulers, in mortals in whom there is no help. Happy are they who have the God of Jacob for their help, whose hope is in the Lord their God. Who gives justice to those who are oppressed and food to those who are hungry. The Lord sets the captive free. The Lord cares for the stranger. The Lord sustains the orphan and widow, but frustrates the way of the wicked. The Lord shall reign forever. Your God is mine throughout all generations. Hallelujah. A reading from Second James, the second chapter. Sorry, the reading from James, the second chapter, beginning at the first verse. My brother and sisters. Do you with your acts of favoritism really believe in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ? For if a person with gold rings and in fine clothes comes into your assembly, and if a poor person in dirty clothes comes in, and if you take notice of the one wearing the fine clothes and say, have a seat here, please, while to the one who is poor you say, stand there or sit at my feet, have you not made distinctions among ourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers and sisters. Has not God chosen the poor of the world to be rich in faith and to be heirs of the kingdom that he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. It is not the rich who oppress you. It is not they who drag you in. Is it not they who drag you into court? Is it not they who blaspheme the excellent name that, is invoked, that was invoked over you? You do well if you really fulfill the royal laws according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you so show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For the one who said you shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder. But if you do not commit adultery but you murder, you become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brother and sisters, if you, if you have faith but do not have works? Can faith save you? If a brother or sister is naked and lacks daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and eat your fill, and yet you do not supply their bodily needs, what is the good of that? So faith by itself, if it has no works, is dead. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Please stand for the gospel.
Gospel according to Mark, the seventh chapter. From there he set out and went away to the region of Tyre. He entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there, yet he could not escape notice. But a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit immediately heard about him, and she came and bowed down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile of Syrophoenician origin. She begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. He said to her, Let the children be fed first, for it is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Sir, even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. Then he said to her, For saying that, you may go. The demon has left your daughter. So she went home, found the child lying on the bed, and the demon gone. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought him, to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech, and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private, away from the crowd, and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then, looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephetha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one. But the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure, saying, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace and peace to you from God, our Creator, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You received today a, a little insert, another insert in your bulletin with a map on it, so I'm going to invite you to, to pull that out. We're going to try to keep up where Jesus is going in this Mark 7. Last week, that showdown of Jesus and the Pharisees and the scribes happened in Gennesaret. That's the little blue dot there by the Sea of Galilee, kind of in the top of the middle of the page there. And so he was there last week um, with the, the Jewish leaders. Gennesaret is very much Jewish territory. As you can imagine, as he's dealing with those Jewish leaders and religious officials, uh, very familiar territory to Jesus. Mark's gospel is a very quickly paced gospel. There's healing after healing, exorcism after exorcism. If you have a chance, I'd invite you to, to do this. There's a website, BibleGateway.com. You may have heard about it, but it's simply the Bible in as many translations as you can think up online, and you can search there for audio Bibles. And there's one that is called the Dramatized Version. This is totally free. You don't have to sign up for anything. And you can go and just listen to the reading of Scripture, and they do it in a, a really fun way. I did this for Mark, and I was so intrigued by the way I was quickly drawn into the story of the miracles and the signs and, again, the healings, the exorcisms that Jesus is doing as he fairly quickly moves from place to place and encounters different people as he goes along. So right at the opening of our gospel text, we learn that Jesus is moving from Gennesaret. He's moving from that little blue dot up to Tyre. Circled in yellow. It's a little hard to see, but there on the coast of the Mediterranean Sea, Tyre sits there. I drew this as the crow flies. I'm not really sure what route Jesus would have taken. But you can see that it's quite a distance. It's, it's about 30, 35 miles on, on the straight line. And remember, he's not catching the, the best fare deal on Southwest Airlines, right? <laughs> he's going on foot. So definitely a multiple day travel. He's going quite a distance. And so that distance is something really important to think about, but it's also important to think about what kind of place Tyre is. T 
Tyre is definitely no longer Jewish territory. When Jesus shows up in Tyre, Jesus is now the outsider. It's a place known for open opposition, perhaps even violence towards Jewish people. Definitely not on top 10 vacation spots for Jewish people. And so I just have to wonder, what drives Jesus to go to Tyre? Is it because he just got done telling the Jewish religious leaders to get outside their box, to look beyond the tradition of the elders, to get back to the heart of the law, love God, love neighbor? I'd like to think that's what Jesus is doing. He's going there to walk the walk because he's talked the talk. But then his answer to this Syrophoenician woman just perplexes me. She's begging him to heal her daughter, and he basically says, I came for the Jews first. What? You just got the, what? That doesn't make sense. And so I think there's a lot of ways to shake this passage out. But this desperate begging of a mother, a Gentile, <coughs> Greek, Syrophoenician woman to Jesus, the Jewish rabbi, exemplifies that faith that I think Jesus is talking about to those Jewish leaders, exemplifies that faith that Jesus is talking to us about. Jesus didn't outright say no, but this mother has to push him. She urges Jesus and pushes Jesus because she knows there is something about Jesus that he did not come just for a select few. She knows that there is something about this man that will heal her daughter. And I think she knows that there is something about the power of God that knows no limits. There's no touch of Jesus to this girl. There's no word spoken directly to this girl. That healing is performed at a distance. And honestly, that seems so strange to me. I just want Jesus to have to like touch her or talk to her. My own rational thinking wants to disbelieve what happens because of the expectations and parameters I put around God's work and God's work in the world. We like to do that, don't we? We like to stay in control, even so far as limiting to where God can work and where God can't. And then we're surprised when God doesn't follow our rules. When God shows up and we're reminded that God is working despite our best efforts to stay in control. So then this passage brings us another setting change. We had the encounter in Tyre with a Syrophoenician woman. And then verse 31, we follow Jesus back towards the Sea of Galilee. But first he's going to, it says it goes by the way of Sidon. So you can see there, Tyre up the coast to Sidon, back towards the Sea of Galilee. But he's going to kind of pass up familiar territory and go down to the Decapolis. The Decapolis, you can kind of see that that means really just a region. That was a region of ten cities that were just the heart of Greek Hellenistic culture. So again, very unfamiliar territory for Jesus to be in. Jesus is pushing beyond what is familiar. Jesus is going beyond what is comfortable. And he's going to places where, quite frankly, as a Jewish man, at risk for violence and harassment. Again, we see that God's work knows no limits. Today, you may have noticed that a few of us are wearing uh, bright colored yellow shirts. I love the color because you can't miss it, right? And so this Sunday, September the 9th, across our whole national church body, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, we are coming together to sort of celebrate this tagline. This tagline of God's work, our hands, isn't something just for this Sunday, but that's for every day. The ELCA has this tagline of God's work, our hands. So churches across the nation are coming together 
to do service projects, kicking off campaigns of, for donations, to, to do something that we do with our hands, but we recognize as God's work. You'll notice that that tagline is two sentences. I am really no grammar police at all, trust me. But I think it's really important that we read that tagline as two sentences. God's work, our hands. There are things we are involved with, and that work is from our hands. Whether it's turning the dirt of a community garden, or tying quilts to be shipped across the globe. It's our hands that complete those tasks, but we must not forget whose work that is. It is God's work. Just like this is not our church, our money, or our building, it is God's. All that we have belongs to the one who makes this all a reality. And the exciting thing is, the exciting thing is, is that while all we have belongs to God, we are invited into participation of the mission of God. As stewards of the earth and all that is in it, we get the privilege. We get the privilege to take care of those things as if we owned them. We are invited into loving and serving the world that God loves. I've been so fortunate to hear so many stories about Huddle Lutheran. That has really been a deep sense of joy for me in these first few weeks here, just to hear so many stories about the way that this congregation is working in our community and in our world. And so as I thought about today, this one stood out to me. Donna, you can correct me after the service if I get this wrong. Um, as I typed it, I began to wonder, is this really right? But I think, I think this is what I heard. Many of you know that our not perfect quilters quilt many quilts over the course of the year and support Lutheran World Relief with those. You see those displayed on our pews. They're so colorful, so inviting. And so my understanding is that as we sent these off in some sort of publication, we saw one of the ones that was quilted right here at Hutto because the fabric was recognized. And so as I thought about just what a way to, to, to really exemplify the way that our hands did this work, very literally, but then how on earth does it happen that across the globe then we get to see that happen other than an all-knowing, always present, all-powerful God who is the orchestrator of that work. That that is really God's work and we get, got to play a part in that. When we put our hands to use and then commend the work of our hands to God and truly resign that work to God, there are no limits as to what can happen. God's work knows no boundaries. God's work knows no borders. And God's work goes beyond anything that we could ever dream up ourselves. After the deaf and mute man is healed today in the gospel reading, the crowds and those who witnessed the work of God through Jesus could not remain silenced. And I'm sure that the man who can now speak he especially could not remain silenced. You and I get to be a part of God's work in the world. You and I get to participate in doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly with God. We get to put our hands to use, and it is God who is going to transform that work into grace and mercy. And we cannot be silent about sharing and proclaiming with others who does that work. The stories that you and I have about encountering the work of God in our lives, the work of God in the life of us as a congregation, and in our community, we cannot remain silent about that. God is going to go into those places of our lives that are Tyre and Sidon and the Decapolis. God is not limited by distance, or God is not, definitely not concerned about being comfortable Despite our best efforts to put limits as to what God can do, God is going to move past those limits and surprise us. May we continue to faithfully put our hands to serving our neighbor and trust and commend our work to be God's work, God's work that knows no limits. Amen. We sing together hymn number 722.